Greetings, Pair Sharpens and Retrogrades. Welcome to a new week. Today's episode will treat the Vatican II documents, specifically the constitutional text of Vatican II. The debate swirls on in regard to the universe of possible meaning attached to the Vatican II documents. One side says, look, there's clearly, um, a pretty clearly an evil intent that went into the writing and the ratification of these documents. And the other side says, no, we don't think there is clearly an intent. Is there a third position to be had? Of course, my answer has always been, yes, there is. It has everything to do with seeding that intent can be evil, but the meaning of a document, a specifically, a specific type of document, a sacred or a secular constitution, is a ratified document and the meaning is not equivalent to the intent. We're going to talk about that today. And the long and the short of it is, as I've told you guys before, when it comes to the Vatican II constitutions, I think I have the final word. I defy anyone out there to listen to the eight or nine points in today's show and point out some specific issue with them, some flaw, some fallacy. I say you won't be able to do it. Now, today's show will be the last one of the week because we're taking a little vacation. I might be back with you on Saturday where I'll return. If That's if something really newsworthy, something really important happens between tomorrow and Saturday. Then who knows? Maybe I'll just pop up and do a, a quick show on it. But this will be the last show for our week of uh, fourth week of July. 2022. Okay, so the constitutions of Vatican II. I want to point out to you people that at a first blush, the new mass is the worst thing to come out of Vatican II. This is something trads debate. A lot of them agree with me. A lot of them say, no, the documents besides Sacrosanctum Concilium represent doctrinal errors, and that's primarily where I'm speaking today, uh, is to that, that latter party. Because I do assert, with many of you trads out there, that the worst part of Vatican II is the sort of second or third derivative mass we got out of it. We call it the Novus Ordo. Boy, it's really bad. <laughs> and we're, we're not so tolerant of it. Uh, Steph, maybe we can, we can get that picture up. There's a kind of bimodalism that has been interjected into our lives, the lives of the faithful, by some of the time getting stuck at the Novus Ordo Mass, the other time you make it to a TLM, and it's like a wedge in your mind, right? So I, I want to first, just by way of uh, being lighthearted, pitch to you people what the ultimate Novus Ordo outfit is. Of course, a three-piece suit, gentlemen, if you have it, is the only thing that suffices if you're going to the TLM, because it accords with the respect that's due there. But to a Novus Ordo, can we show the picture, Steph? When we go to the Novus Ordo, this is the ultimate outfit. You know, we've, we've often complained here on Rules for Retrogrades about the over-casuality of the Novus Ordo outfit. Gentlemen, button-up shirt, collared, of course. Uh, come on, come on. Button-up shirt with a collar, please. No t-shirts, show respect. Right? Look at this. But at the same time, the Council Fathers of Vatican II want you culturally comfortable. You will note the lack of sleeves. In the cultural context, particularly of summertime, the American gentleman will remove his sleeves, as you see there. So I, I say this is collar, buttons, and no sleeves. Also, shorts below the knee, people. There are prying eyes all around the eyes of, of young ladies, and so shorts below the knee, ideally I should say waterproof shorts below the knee. Once again, the Vatican Council Fathers wanted mass and all of its accoutrements culturally appropriate, culturally sensitive. It is summertime, I live in the South. I would assert, as the Novus Ordo wants to appropriate summertime culture, and the, the culture in which I live, uh, it still wants you to be comfortable. Therefore, you should have waterproof shorts. What if you're traveling to your Novus Ordo and on the way to Mass, 
You see a lake, a river, a stream, a creek, a body of water. Maybe it's an ocean. The cathedral uh, um, in Alabama is right next to the ocean. Now, if you're going to a Novus Ordo, it's appropriate to have waterproof board shorts, as you see in this photo. Now, if you're going to a TLM, like my TLM in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, well, you're not allowed to wear your board shorts, right? That wouldn't be appropriate culturally because the culture of TLM is one of respect. But since the culture of the Novus Ordo is outright disrespect, the appropriate thing to do is to wear your most comfortable board shorts below the knee, gentlemen. Closed-toed <laughs> shoes also, I, I would say, you know, you lace them all the way to the top or you can leave the top loop unlaced, but preferably rallies. If you're wearing Vans, you see my uh, full top Jeff rallies and it, I mean, they're off the wall. They look delightful. Be respectful. That's all we ask. Be culturally appropriate. <laughs> Nova Sordo outfit. It goes without saying, if you're going to a TLM, three piece suit. Okay. Oh, we're having a bit of fun because there's almost nothing fun about Vatican II. It's a disaster. I'll say by way of opening, something that I haven't announced yet. As you know, I was researching and about to begin work on what would have been my fifth book on Vatican II. Now I have all the research, I have all the arguments marshaled. Originally that book was going to be about 40 or 45,000 words. It's a short book and it was gonna be on Tan books. Tan and I have parted ways as amicably as possible, as you all know. And I'm not seeking to place this book with another publisher. I'm also not publishing it by self-publication. Here's why. A three to 5,000 word article is the more appropriate length for what I have to say in that book. And much of it, not all, but much can be covered in a show like this. And it's a topic I have dealt with on TNT one of the last shows we did on TNT, I, I, I treated this pretty, pretty thoroughly. I've done one or two shows here on this channel thoroughly where I explain the jurisprudence, the only appropriate jurisprudence for interpreting the Vatican II documents. And I'm about to get to that in a second. But it's, it's, a, it's a long article, a 3,500 word article. It is not even a short book by content. So it's, um, I believe, provident that I'm no longer writing this book. Okay, with that said, let me give you the premises. I wouldn't give you all the premises of a book I'm writing if I'm gonna publish it in the future, but now I feel good. Now, here's, this is basically nine easy points, okay? Nine very easy points to understanding the jurisprudence of the Vatican II constitutions. This is not the kind of thing that theologians, I might add, are trained to do. The only people that understand this, what I'm, the, the principles that I'm going to be laying out today, are academic jurisprudence, you know, scholar, legal scholars of jurisprudence, and philosophers of language, or at least analytic philosophers. And I'm going to be citing an analytic philosopher, Stanley Fish, as we proceed. The reason I say so is because the, the concepts are simply foreign. And when you let theologians bandy about this, you get nowhere, which is why people don't understand the very basic principles. I can prove to you my case that I do think there's an evil intent in a sense in the documents, but that the meaning, the original public meaning of the documents turns out harmless, even for a, um, a much bandied about uh, Vatican II document such as Nostra Aetate. Let's get into it though first in these nine points. Number one, when we as Catholics speak of the council, Vatican II, we aren't speaking about being bound by the historical contingencies or happenstances of the gathering, the event. What they ate for lunch doesn't matter, though that happened. It was, it was a three and a half year council. They were eating lunch every day. Uh, we are bounded by considerations such as what was said at, the gossip that was said at or between sessions, what hotel or uh, uh, holy house the council fathers were patronizing if they're from out of town, who peed on whose doormat in disrespect, and I wish I were just uh, being, being proverbial. Some of the liberal modernists actually have been accused of peeing on the doorstep of some of the conservatives. 
So that's not what I mean when I say the council. For Catholics, what we're banding about, point number one, is not the historic event of the meeting of the council itself. We're talking about the memorialized council, which became part of Catholic magisterium, which is to say the documents. Now, there are a total of like 16 documents. I'm actually, for today's show, I'm not distinguishing between constitutions, decrees, and declarations. For our purposes, in the wider sense of the genus term, they're all constitutions, even though there are three subtypes of constitutions, only one of which is called a constitution. So I'll be using that term in the generic sense today. The constitutions or the documents memorializing the council, the event of which stretched from 1962 to 1965, those are what bind us as Catholics. So that brings us to point number two. What is a constitution? Now, sacred constitutions come from gatherings called councils, ecumenical councils. There's only one kind of sacred constitution that's valid. Uh, how do I know? Because there's only one true faith. Secular constitutions come from gatherings called ratification conventions. Okay, so secular constitutions come from conventions. Sacred constitutions come from ecumenical councils. All constitutions, sacred and secular, are authored by two types of authors. So this is point number two. Point number one is when we speak of the council, we're talking about the documents, not the event, not the contingencies, historically speaking, but the, the documents. Point number two is that there are two types of constitutions, sacred and secular, but all constitutions have two senses of authorship that separate written constitutions, sacred and secular, from other kinds of written documents, like a novel, like a newspaper like a magazine. Here's what it is. Constitutions, sacred and secular, the U.S. Constitution and, say, Nostra Aetate, have a scribe, a person that actually writes down the ideas, maybe is probably equivalent to the person who first hatched the ideas. That's the primary sense of author. It's the most common sense of author. But there's a secondary author, at, let's say, the Virginia Constitutional Ratification Convention at Richmond in June of 1788, where the members of the most important state, Virginia, met to decide whether the state of Virginia would ratify the U.S. federal constitution, there were about 175 delegates. Anyone who either wrote the constitution, see James Madison, the single primary author of the entire constitution pertained to the state of Virginia and he was at Richmond. So the primary author, James Madison, was there at Richmond a year after he wrote it. But there were about 174, 179 other authors of the constitution in the sense that they were ratifiers of it. Do you understand the difference? A single authored text, like a novel, a newspaper article, a magazine article, has but one author. And this is going to affect whether or not we're able to conflate meaning and intent. Uh, I'll give you an example about that later. I'll give you some, some um, Mark Twain examples. If the author is the sole author, then intent is much more bound up in meaning. However, if you have 180 authors as the, the ratifiers of the uh, Virginia Ratification Convention would end up being, then intent plays a much smaller role in determining what the meaning of a document is. But anyone who wrote on the bottom line, yes, I ratify this document, they become a secondary author. This only applies to constitutions, whether sacred or secular. There are over 5,000 authors in this secondary sense at Vatican II, ratifiers of the document, okay? 
You know lots of them. A lot, most of them, you don't know their names. But even Marcel Lefebvre was one of the authors in this secondary sense of each of the Vatican II documents. Now, here's the word to ratify, the definition. It'll prove to you what I'm saying. It's to sign a treaty or a constitution, making it officially valid. A second sense, this comes from Cornell Law, of to ratify is to enact a legally binding act. This is better. It takes what was a proposed legal action and binds not only all of the signers to it, but a sovereign people as well. The people of America, once nine states individually ratified the U.S. Constitution, in the case of the, sec the sacred constitutions of Vatican II, it bound all of the people of God once you had a quorum of signers. And for whatever reasons, there was a much more live, active debate between ratifiers and anti-ratifiers with the secular constitution. There should have been a much more active debate between ratifiers and anti-ratifiers at Vatican II. It's surprising that there wasn't. Okay, so I hope you understand. Sacred constitutions come from Council, secular constitutions come from conventions. All constitutions have two senses of author, primary and secondary. A ratifier is a secondary author. Now, this is point number three here. Because of dual, the dual authorship of ratified constitutions, sacred or secular, all constitutions must be interpreted in a fundamentally different way than single authored text like a novel. Written by Mark Twain. Therefore, the intent, if it's plain on the page, has more to do with the meaning of, say, Huckleberry Finn than the intent of a multiply authored document that had to be ratified, like Nostra Aetate. Intent and meaning are severed, in other words. Is this clear? Can, 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 if, you, if you guys want to jump in, ask me. Intent and meaning get almost fully severed in the case of a ratified document, a constitution. Because, <clears throat> we'll get into the particulars later, but there's a, a real operational, functional reason why this must be the case, and I can prove it to you. If I write the doc, if I'm James Madison and I write a document, and I write some little private jokes, some inside jokes in the document that one other person in the room will get, Yet it requires a supermajority of those persons in the room to ratify the document, to make it a real thing, then everybody but one, every member of the ratifying quorum, save one, would be ratifying a private meaning that they have no clue about, okay? Therefore, the public meaning of the document, of the words in the document, even if an inside joke or a private esoteric secret is wired into the document, the public meaning must be what's considered. At the level of all text, of thought itself, what a ratified constitution stands for. Is that somewhat clear, Steph? Just, just so that I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of people, because most people haven't studied jurisprudence, they haven't studied the philosophy of language, they don't understand. But there's a real, I'd say, common sense meaning why ratified constitutions, unlike, say, inferring the intent of a single author like uh, Mark Twain, uh, s dissevers the real meaning of the document and intent. Now, for one example, um, you know, in a single authored text, what we know about an author's intent bears heavily on our understanding of his text meaning. For example, Mark Twain was known to have disliked slavery before, during, and after the existence of slavery, or during and after, I should say. So his employment of certain racial epithets in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn can rightly, helpfully, be interpreted to be anti-racist. Huckleberry Finn is the most censored book in American history, uh, uh, by the public schools anyway, but the racial epithets that he uses are just part of the enculturation of America in 1850s, 1860s America. But it's very clear by the private writings of Mark Twain, the intent that we can speak of coherently of the book as a whole, the work as a whole. Huckleberry Finn's an anti-slavery book, an anti-racism book. So he's using 
those racial epithets in an anti-racist way. Here, intentionalism with a single author makes a little more sense. I'm still not endorsing it. We're going to talk about intentionalism in a second. I'll, I'll fully unpack it. But constitutions being multiple authored texts are totally different. All right. That's points one, two, and three. Number four, even multiple authored constitutions, ratified constitutions like Nostra Aetate and the other Vatican II documents, however, still have a primary author. And we know who some of the primary authors of some of the Vatican documents are, by the way, Vatican II documents. And those primary authors do still bear what can be, I don't mean in an apodictic certain way, but a discernible intent. And the problem with the Vatican II documents that all trads have, parish orphans, retrogrades, myself, is that the discernible, discernible intent in several of the, of the primary authors of the uh, documents was nefarious, bad intent. That's, that's pretty clear. Maybe not 100%. We can't say I'm certain. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. But, you know, with clear and convincing evidence, the middle standard of uh, burden of persuasion at law, I would say but we're 75% sure whoever wrote the individual document, Gaudium et Space, Lumen Gentium, in this case, Nomen uh, uh, Nostra Aetate, there's a pretty nefarious intent, a usage of what has come to be fashionably called weaponized ambiguity. This is, in some sense, like a, a single-authored text, like reading intent from The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, but only in one way. The difference is that in ratified text, intent has nothing to do with the ratified meaning, with the meaning that, let's say, take the U.S. Constitution, is being carried from a proposed document with four corners here. Just a proposed document. It's being carried into the lifeblood of a new nation. And we're saying this is a, this is a thing that now has the express and virtual ratification of all the people. It's got the express ratification of representatives of the people, and it's got the vertical, ra uh, sorry, virtual ratification of the people that they represent. So that's, that's what you have there. Um, but in the ratified text, the intent of one or two or maybe a hundred of the 5,000 ratifiers of the Vatican II documents cannot in any sense be said to be the real meaning of those texts. The real meaning is the original public meaning. We're going to get to that in a second. Okay? So it's quite simple. In the first four points, I just explain how and why there's a fundamental distinction between single-authored documents that don't require ratification and then constitutions, which are multiple authors on a document that require a vote, a ratification vote. What's being carried from a proposed document into part of the census fidelium of the church is the original public meaning that was in fact ratified. Not private little jokes, esoteric Straussian meaning. That doesn't count as part of what gets ratified. Point number five. Most of you have heard because of the late and great Catholic Supreme Court Justice, considered one of the greatest of all time on the bench, Nino Scalia, Antonin Scalia. You've heard of originalism. Originalism is a jurisprudential philosophy. I studied in great depth at my law school. We had a close relationship with Scalia. I met him a few times and uh, was able to discuss jurisprudence with him a few times. What most of you don't know is that, this is point number five, there are two species of originalism. One reflects everything I said at the top of this video, points one through four, and is the correct one. The other one does not reflect these points and is therefore not correct. All right, point number six. The incorrect species of originalism is called intentionalism, and it is most often considered championed 
by philosopher of language Stanley Fish. It's not difficult to understand. Intentionalism equates the intent of the primary author with meaning in a roughly equivalent way that we would equate Mark Twain's intent in Huckleberry Finn with the meaning of the book. If you're a Stranger Things fan, you would ask the writer, maybe the writer and the director together, well, what did you intend for this sort of vague spot at the end of season four to mean? His answer will govern, right? His, his intent is really the meaning. So we're asking sort of a metaphysical question of interpretation. This is what jurisprudence do. They're trying to construct meaning because no text is self-interpreting. You understand? Intentionalism, though, deals with ratified constitutions, the special kind of written document, as it would any other text where intent is meaning. And this is erroneous. It's an easy pitfall. It's what most of you do. And it's what almost everyone in the Catholic world, Novus Ordo lover, Vatican II lover, Novus Ordo critiquer, Vatican II critiquer, has engaged in is Vatican II document intentionalism in the fashion of this non-Catholic, anti-Catholic Stanley Fish, philosopher of language who reified intentionalism. Under intentionalism by Stanley Fish, private meanings, inside jokes are susceptible as valid interpretations even if the vast majority of the ratifying body, that is to say the second authors on a constitution, sacred or secular, had no clue about it, which makes no sense. Under intentionalism, the intent of a private author or maybe a handful of authors out of 5,000 ratifiers of Vatican II documents like Nostra Aetate, therefore are bringing into life, together with, I guess, the Holy Spirit, are bringing into life something they have no clue about, private meanings, private ambiguities that have been weaponized. That cannot happen. That's because of point number seven today. The true iteration, and I can prove the point to you, the true iteration of originalism is Justice Scalia's textualism, where true meaning is said to be the original public meaning of a document. There are two elements to this. It's got to be the original meaning and the public meaning. Original meaning is this. If a document is ratified in 1963, then the use of a word, let's say the word is gay. What did gay mean in 1963? Mean happy? Or did it mean homosexual? I don't know when that, that meaning changed. But because words' meanings change, we have to go to our uh, etymologies, and our thesauruses and textbooks, Black's Law Dictionary, and we say, what did this word mean at the time? So the original meaning of the word and original dated to when? Dated to the nanosecond that the quorum of ratifiers ratifies the document. So what did this mean on this date? That's original meaning. And guess what? In U.S. constitutional debates, many of which I've been a very active part of in my, my sort of other life as a jurisprude, we most often debate this element of Scalian textualism with the U.S. Constitution. What was the original meaning? We don't debate the second element so much. Public meaning. Public meaning is the second element of passing the Scalian textualism text test. And it's more important for Catholics when we debate the documents, the constitutions of Vatican II. I'll explain why. Public meaning, I've already explained it a little bit. It means what the person who's not in on an inside joke or an inside heist or an inside commandeering in the case of the Ronerites at Vatican II, what they would make of it on, of course, that original date. The, the, the original meaning gets time stamped. It gets sealed like a time capsule. What did gay mean in 1963? Not what does it mean now? Because now that quiddity, that set of essences, those elemental properties, they might be baked into a whole different word, what it means to be joyful 
joyful meant gay in 1963. I know that quiddity has been baked into another word and the word gay has taken on a different quiddity, but that's not what matters. What was ratified in this imaginary document from 1963, no, I'm not talking about Sacrosanctum Concilium because it doesn't have that word, is whatever the word was originally, but also publicly. What the reading public, literate reading public, would think it meant and what ratifiers who are the secondary authors at a ratifying convention or a council, if it's a sacred document, what they thought they were ratifying. Can a primary author who knows that his document is going to be passed before 5,000 ratifiers, is it possible, is it feasible for him to hardwire into the document inside jokes, um, instances of what I call codified heteropraxy, inside weaponizations of the faith? Yes. And that's precisely what we all strongly intuit happened. Okay? But here's the key. Here's the kicker. What the faithful are bound to is the public meaning, not those private meanings, not the weaponized ambiguity, not the codified time-released heteropraxy in the case of the Mass, not the codified time-released heteropraxy in the case of the quasi-doctrines of such documents as uh, Lumen Gentium and Nostra Aetate. I hope this is making sense. It's, it's actually not hard stuff if you follow each step. So we're on textualism. The original public meaning is the real meaning. This is the correct form of originalism, Scalian textualism. It combats the incorrect form of originalism, Stanley Fishian intentionalism, by saying, yes, there can be, into the, in these group documents, constitutions, there can be a little trick pulled off by the primary authors as per the secondary authors. They can write little, little inside jokes. We used to do this when our, our teacher would read our notes aloud in class. We'd write inside jokes to each other. That doesn't mean the teacher is ratifying them or the class as a whole is ratifying them by sitting there and listening to them and nodding their head. Our inside jokes or our inside weaponized ambiguities, what have you, are not being ratified by the census fidelium. They're not being ratified into the census fidelium. You see, it's got to be the original public meaning. Original is a more important thing to debate with uh, constitutional jurisprudence. Public is a more important thing to debate with Vatican II scholars. Um, okay. So I, I've, I've hit that pretty hard. Now, as I've said before, I've, I've said all this publicly. I've made this claim before. And like I said, I was beginning to research a book. So as I go to point number eight, I would say most of you, if not all, substantially most, have been biased against this term used by Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger for the first time, the hermeneutic of continuity, as a bad thing. The hermeneutic of continuity, I submit to you, given points one through seven above, applies whenever there's a noteworthy non-negligible divergence between ostensible intent in a sacred constitution by the first author. There is no intent of all 5,000 authors together. But uh, when there's a divergence between ostensible intent by the first author and the meaning of the document. In other words, the hermeneutic of continuity rightly understood is not only a healthy thing, it's a necessary thing. Why? Because it is possible, and I would say actual in the case of the Vatican II documents, for a primary author to pass a document under the noses of 5,000 plus other ratifiers some very, very conspicuous words and turns of phrase that are what we call in law terms of art, that have private meanings, that can be manipulated later. And we've all heard the, the expression by one of the council fathers, by one of the modernist Ron Wright council fathers, Skilibex, we use terms of art and we knew what we were going to do with them later. Mischief. Those 
the, the hermeneutic of continuity says, look, the Vatican II documents, let's take the document on the mass for a second, because I'm not really talking about it too much for the rest of, of this show. Sacrosanctum Concilium. It was written vaguely. There's nothing offensive in it. Archbishop Lefebvre signed it along with all the rest, thinking that not much change would come to the Mass. There's no guarantee that no change would come to the Mass, on the one hand, but there's certainly no guarantee of, of great change on the other. So in a spirit of trust or what have you, they ratified it. Okay, so as this thing was specified over the next seven years between 1963 and late 1969, then some of the ratifiers of the document, like Archbishop Lefebvre, said, what, what have I done? Certainly not this. I didn't intend to do this. Okay, so that's how codified heteropraxy works with a document that doesn't contain doctrines. It's a document on disciplines, like the liturgy. But mo and, and, and there, we pretty much, most people agree, you know, that this is what happened. Skilibix was being honest. It's readily apparent that this is what happened. Concilium versus Communio, the two equivalents of congressional subcommittees that took Sacrosanctum Concilium, the actual Vatican document, on what the new Mass would be. It's written in vague terms. They made it more specific, and they intentionally made it much more specific in a Masonic and Protestant direction. That's why we see such a, if I can, you know, not be too on the nose, such a Masonic, quasi-Masonic, Protestant new mass. That's why. No one, no one out there really disagrees. I'm not offering much new there. What I'm offering that's new is that the hermeneutic of continuity, particularly as we apply it to the pseudo- doctrinal or the quasi-doctrinal Vatican II constitutions like Nostra Aetate means that even as, this is the catch, even as we see the primary authors of some of these texts probably, very probably did have a mischievous intent, worse than mischievous intent, evil intent for parts of Lumen Gentium, Gaudium et Space, Nostra Aetate. Nostra Aetate will be my test case today. That doesn't bind the church, the magisterium, the hierarchy in the future, or the faithful to those private meanings because real meaning is original public meaning. And therefore, what will happen under... Thank you very much, Justice Scalia. I learned all of this because when I went to law school, I didn't take bar classes mostly. I took as many jurisprudence and constitution classes as I could. Not many even lawyers know this stuff. It's a very few minds that understand Scalian textualism very well. I knew it was the right version of originalism even before I cared much about the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council. I know it is the savior to the abusive, modernist, Masonic interpretation of the Second Vatican Council. But unlike others who offer the last sentence I just offered, I don't mean to rescue the intent of the primary authors of these Vatican, Second Vatican Council documents. I'm saying, no, the intent is probably what the trads think it was, evil. But what are we bound to? Thank you very much. Good conception of the hermeneutic of continuity. We're not bound to the most mischievous interpretation, which is the private one that's become apparent. Okay, so let's apply all of this to a test case, Nostra Aetate. Let me, let me read for you the second paragraph of Nostra Aetate, and I will apply to you, uh, I will read for you the, uh, the, the way the intentionalist would read this and the way the textualist, like myself, would read this document. And it will become clear that there's a very real difference. Now, the second paragraph of Nostra Aetate Many of you have a problem with it, as you should, in the sense that I'm offering. It goes like this. Throughout history to the present day, there is found among different peoples a certain awareness of a hidden power which lies behind the course of nature and the events of human life. Just word salad. Um, at times, there is present even a recognition of a supreme being or still more of a father. 
This awareness and recognition results in a way of life that is imbued with a deep religious sense. Here's where it gets really sticky. The religions, which are found in more advanced civilizations, they mean non-Christian religions, endeavor by way, endeavor is the load-bearing verb. That means try. By way of, a well, of well-defined concepts and exact language to answer these questions. So the verb on point for that sentence is endeavor. I will point out, I'm going to go on in a second, but bear in mind there's such a thing as a use mention distinction. Philosophers of language talk about. There's also something like a species of use mention distinction, which is assertion citation distinction. If I say, my crazy uncle Remus thinks he can fly, I am not asserting that I think uncle Remus can fly. I'm saying he thinks he can fly. Or my crazy uncle Remus endeavors to fly by flapping his arms. That doesn't mean that I think he's going to do it. I am citing his beliefs. I am not asserting that his beliefs are true. Same thing, use or mention. If, you're, if one of your little kids, uh, you have multiple kids and one says, shit, the next kid famously will say, little Billy said shit. Why? Because kids want an excuse to do something they're not otherwise allowed to do. This is the use, classic case of the use mentioned distinction. Little Billy, who's telling on the other kid, I forget, let's say you have two little Billies, like George Foreman. Little Billy who didn't use the term, that's going to be the one in trouble. The one that's tattling on him is just mentioning to you that mischievous little Billy used the term. There's a distinction, and it's similar to the assertion citation distinction. So when this Definitely mischievous section of the second paragraph of Nostra Aetate begins by saying that these other world religions endeavor to accomplish such and thus. Bear in mind the use mention or the assertion citation distinction. They're just saying crazy Uncle Remus thinks he can do this. Um, thus, in Hinduism, I'll continue, people explore the divine mystery and express it both in the limitless riches of myth and the accurately defined insights of philosophy. So the verb that is load-bearing here is explore. This means to try to investigate. Beat poets explored all kinds of crappy poetry in the 60s, and they explored drugs and things like that as well. That's not an endorsement that they've come to any veracity in their explorations, you see. I'll continue. They seek... That means they're trying to get it. They seek release from the trials of the present life by ascetical practices, profound meditation, recourse to God and confidence in love. Now, Buddhism, this is where people go extra crazy. Partly rightly, partly wrongly. Buddhism, in its various forms, testifies to the essential inadequacy of this changing world. So testifies is a slightly stronger endorsement it's a slightly stronger verb than the use mention or the assertion citation distinction. But that's because all that the Vatican father who wrote Nostra Aetate is saying Buddhism testifies is the essential inadequacy of the ephemeral changing world. So that's fine. But here's the key sentence next. It, Buddhism, proposes a way of life, assertion, citation, distinction, by which people can with confidence and trust attain a state of perfect liberation and reach supreme illumination either through their own efforts or with divine help. Okay, so you know lots of trads who have gone crazy about this because of the word perfect, supreme, perfect liberation, supreme illumination, but you have to do the grammar. Buddhism, I'll go back, proposes a way of life by which your crazy Uncle Remus might have proposed a way of life by which he could fly by flapping his arms. You can't do it. Now, that's not the end of the story. This is just, for, for the trads out there that have made these really, really basic mistakes, I'm not the first one to point out that they're mistakes. Assertion, citation, distinction, use, mention, distinction. It's pretty basic. You could teach your kindergartner that. That's fine. It's just a basic error that trads have made by going nuts. Um, the next sentence, the last sentence is, so too, other religions, non-Christian, which are found throughout the world, attempt in different ways to overcome the restlessness of people's hearts by outlining a program of life covering doctrine. 
moral precepts, sacred rights. Note the load-bearing term, attempt. Your crazy Uncle Remus might attempt to fly by flapping his arms. So the problem is this. The defenders of the Vatican II documents and, I might add, <laughs> the uh, attackers of the Vatican II documents are both, both sides are intentionalists, Stanley Fish intentionalists. The attackers of the documents will, of course, point this out, forgetting basic stuff, far more basic than what I've been talking about today, like the use mentioned distinction. And they'll, they'll just say, look, the intent is bad. And overlooking the precise verbiage, specifically the verbs of the verbiage in the language, they'll say, and the language is bad. They'll be countered by somewhat brainlessly and allergically by pro-Vatican II defenders who are also intentionalists. They'll point out what I just pointed out, the defenders of the documents. They'll say, no, you mentioned distinction, man. Your crazy Uncle Remus attempts to fly. But then the defenders of Vatican II will, by so doing, they will never go further. They will never cede to the traditionalists what they ought to be ceding because they're intentionalists too. They'll say, no, the language is fine, so the intent's probably fine. The truth is the intent doesn't actually have a bearing on the way that we ought to read the document. It doesn't have a bearing on the way that we're bound to the document. Do you understand? The truth of the matter is intentionalism is wrong. Textualism is what's we're bound, what we're bound to, the original public meaning of the documents. Now, here's what I cede to the traditionalists that get worked up over paragraph two of Nostra Aetate. I do believe that the primary author of this constitution, probably not the ratifiers, said, look, we can sound much more ecumenical. We can sound so ecumenical that we're ecumenic ecumeniacal. What we'll do first is we'll get all of the other ratifiers, the other 5,000 guys here at Vatican II, to ratify this document by pointing at the use mentioned distinction, right? Which we don't see, we don't hear that. That's just, they're caucusing it at a, a constitutional convention called a council. They're like, look, labor, endeavor, attempt. These are the three verbs in these three sentences. It's total, that makes it harmless. So they'll emphasize the use mentioned distinction there to ratify the document. Then once this document got ratified, what do they emphasize? The opposite, spirit of Vatican II ecumenism. And then they say, look at this. This really does. So and you can always get a bunch of people. What are common people really bad at? I wrote a book called Don't Go to College. It debuts in two weeks. I'm not an academic snob, but common people are bad at grammar. Common people are bad at reading text for detail. Common people are not jurisprudence. Okay. I don't have academics on a pedestal, but it's something that the modernist Ronerites at Vatican II knew they could do. Emphasize textualism to get the document ratified, which is actually true. That's all that was ratified, the original public meaning. But thereafter, give the intentionalist read, which is a very ecumenical one. So much that it even tricked lots of, you know, trad podcasters into making a big deal out of this. That's what they did. And that is evil. And that is what's going on. I RA'd for a famous constitutionalist named Mike Rappaport. And he, I forget his nifty little name for the phenomenon, but he, he would talk about the 14th Amendment. He'd talk about the ratification of any amendments in the U.S. Constitution. He'd say, Tim, there's a very particular phenomenon that happens. It's called, he, let's just call it meaning swapping. The anti-federalists will talk to the federalists and say, we're not going to ratify the U.S. Constitution because it makes too big, too powerful a federal government in these five ways. That's the anti-federalist. They'll look at five particular clauses in the document and they'll say, we don't like these. That would be too big of government and we're anti-federalists. We don't like big governments. And the federalists will respond by saying, no, 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 those aren't. Those, those should have a minimalist governmental uh, scope of power. And then if the document gets ratified, and this did actually happen, in 1789, 1790, 1791, the document gets ratified. And then after it's ratified, it's a real thing. The anti-federalists will go, 
Okay, you promised, and now that it's a real thing and we have to deal with this reified document, you Federalists promised us that these five questionable ambiguity, weaponized ambiguity clauses are minimalist in scope. So they swap. This is meaning swapping. And the Federalists will also swap meaning to the Anti-Federalists' original position. And they'll say, hey, you yourself recognized that uh, these five spots were, were kind of inclined toward big government. It happens time and time again in government. It happens with constitutions, ratifications. It happens with the amendments of constitutions being ratified. They swap positions. That's Mike Rappaport's original idea. And it's, I think, precisely what happened with Vatican II as well because everyone, Novus Ordo-loving, Vatican II-loving modernists and trads as well have been duped by the easy pitfall of intentionalism. When everyone agrees to be a textualist, which takes a little more, not to put too fine a point on it, intelligence, a little more caution, a little more pause, be a textualist, where you say, no, that might be the intent of the primary author, but this is a constitution. All that was ratified is the original public meaning. Then you shut all this down. You, <laughs> to quote Kevin Nealon in the immortal Happy Gilmore, you harness the good energy, you block out the bad energy. That's what textualism does. And that's the real way that constitutional texts are to be read and interpreted. And that's why I live in this weird space where I say, actually, the hermeneutic of continuity is just textualism. It saves us. That's why I could say, yes, I think the intent, like all the rest of you trads out there, the original intent of many of the Vatican II documents by the primary author was bad, but the document as a whole was ratified in terms of its original public meaning and is not bad. And that's why you must interpret it along with tradition. Even though they're not now, that's because of the meaning swapping. This is why and how textualism explains everything in the Second Vatican Council and after the Second Vatican Council. So you're welcome. That's, if you can come up with a technical flaw there, intentionalism I knew doesn't trump textualism long before I cared in a serious way about the Second Vatican Council. But if you can come up with a way, you'd be the first one. This is a live debate for any ratified constitution, not just Catholic ones. And hey, Catholic Antonin Scalia beats modernist Stanley Fish any day of the week. Textualism beats intentionalism, and it enables me to live in this space. Thank you very much for living. God bless you all. I'll see you in five or six days. Des Volt.